Sometimes when I say the word engineer to a homeowner, they look at me like I just told them they had to go have their teeth pulled at the dentist. That's sort of the reaction I get half the time. But I have to tell you that I've learned over the years that have, uh, an engineer is really our best friend on a remodel project, particularly during certain stages of it. It's taken me forever to find an engineer willing to show his face on this show. I don't know why, but I finally found a, I mean, I uh, finally found a guy, <laughs> a guy that I work with an awful lot, Jason Conklin with, um, uh, Lighthouse Engineering. Yes, sir. Yes. Jason is a structural forensic engineer. Forensic engineer. Sorry, I, that's a new one to me, so I, I, for, I forgot that. But at any rate, uh, welcome to the show. How are you? Coming. Good, good. I'm, I'm so glad to be here. That's Busy awesome. as can be, which is yeah, yeah. Like, like everybody right now. Right, <laughs> right. So a lot of the questions that I get from people or the reactions I get from homeowners in particular is because they've always been told that, man, when you get an engineer in there, it's going to cost you a ton of money. They're going to over-engineer everything. The materials are going to go up. The labor's going to go up. And then you got to pay the engineer. I have found that, in my view, that actually saves them money maybe 10 years down the road, sometimes not even that long, because you're doing things the way they ought to be done. And so tell us some of the things that you do as an engineer that benefit the homeowner and the builder. So we're always, I, as, from an engineering standpoint, I'm always trying to make the process go smoother. I, I want to make the, the permitting go smoother with the city. I want to make the inspections go smoother, whether it's from the engineering side or from the actual uh, city side. But I also want to make sure that the project is as safe as can be. Uh, we never try to over-engineer anything, but we always follow the, the minimal bi building code for whatever project it is. Um, but then you also get the benefit of the um, on-site inspections from the engineer as well. Mm -hmm. So there's a process involved when you're going to engineer, let's just say, a foundation. Uh, kind of walk through, people don't always understand why it costs the money that it costs a to to get the engineer plan but also the time it takes to get it and the the benefit of it so let's talk let's start with foundation because that's usually the biggest the first thing probably jason does more foundation more people call him up because they have cracks in the walls and in the state of texas that's a normal thing <laughs> mm -hmm. but um let's talk a little bit about your process uh that you go through, let's say I call you up and I say, hey, I need you to engineer a foundation for a house for me. Okay. So if it's, if it's new construction or additions, uh, you know, we go through a process that's to perform an on-site inspection to figure out what, what you've got, what, what your existing structure looks like. Is it capable of handling an addition, which most of them are. Uh, but sometimes the cities require a specific look from an engineer or a letter saying, hey, I've looked at it. The existing foundation is capable of handling an addition. Uh, and then from there, I usually recommend getting a set of plans from either an architect or a designer. You do not always need a uh, certified architect. Certified architects charge a lot more than designers do, but um, I, I think their set of plans is typically about on par with most designers. And mm -hmm. I work with quite a few designers that uh, just they understand the building process. They're not going to over design something that can't be constructed or, or be engineered. And then once those set of plans are acquired, I usually get those plans and review them and then basically make the engineering work from the engineering side. But prior to doing all of that, I have to do a proposal um, setup where once I review the plans, I can basically say, okay, I think it's going to cost X to do the design. But during that design phase, you get a lot of different things from the engineer as well. You get the on-site inspections, you get revisions to plan sets, you get uh, working with the city, calling the city. I usually will always ask for whoever the city inspector in, in, in is. And regarding the city, I'm sorry to interrupt yeah, you, but regarding the city, mm -hmm. the engineers actually kind of uh, outweigh the, any, the city will always rely on the engineers, what I'm trying to say. They will always rely on your letter first. Yes. Yeah, so we our, our engineering letters or, or engineering stamp and seal supersedes, goes above uh, 
any kind of inspector, whether it be mm -hmm. an inspector from a city or a home inspector or even like a third party inspector that comes out to look at but uh, whatever. That, but that puts a lot of that puts a lot of um, responsibility on your shoulders. I it mean, does. You, you have to be very precise and you have to be very careful that you're making the right recommendation. Oh, absolutely. But again, we're following the building code mm -hmm. and, you know, every city follows and adopts a certain building code, but then they can also modify it. So the building code is just a minimal uh, set of regulations. So a lot of times um, I'll call Jason and I'll, I'll be in the middle of a project and I may have, it, I, I've been doing this all my life. I pretty well know what I need to do, but I have become very reliant on uh, Jason and, and other engineers to come in and sort of uh, bless what I'm doing. <laughs> you know, I might put in a beam or I might make a change somewhere and I'll just call them and say, hey, come, come take a look at this. And just in case, you know, let's make sure. And every now and then he'll say, you know, maybe we need to add a little to this or add a little to that. that that's your job. Yes, sir. Yeah. And yeah. so what it does for the homeowner is it provides a safe environment for them structurally sound environment mm -hmm. and so uh, we, we started out talking about the foundation so when you do a foundation you have to you're dealing with soil conditions and in, in this part of the world soil conditions vary greatly just in the north texas region very true what is the process for that you would recommend to a builder let's just say he's building a new house and he says to you, he or she says to you uh, I need this engineered foundation. What's the first thing you tell them? The first thing I tell them, well, the first thing I ask them is where is the home going to be located so I can get a general idea of what the soil is, is like. Because like you, you kind of have a map that shows you different soil conditions in different I do. areas. Yeah, and generally in the North Texas area and, and through the I-35 corridor down towards San Antonio, the soils are going to be highly expansive clay soils. Mm -hmm. And so they, they shrink and swell kind of like a sponge whenever you add water to it, and then it shrinks back to mm -hmm. kind of a smaller version of the original sponge. Uh, but as you go further west, you start getting into rockier, sandier ground, and so the soil is, is different. So I always ask that first. And then secondly— And, and, and then when you go east— it turns into sandy loam. Yeah, and, and the... Quicksand. Yeah, and I, I always say if you see pine trees, you're going to see sand. Pine trees right. do not like the acidity of clay soil, right. so they, they avoid it. So that's why you typically don't see pine trees until you get further east of the Metroplex. But uh, the next step I always insist on is a uh, soils report of some kind. So a geotechnical engineer uh, is a type of engineer that deals with soils, and, and they will do soil samples that will tell you, hey, at so many feet deep, we've got a water table that we have mm -hmm. to deal with, or uh, we have a certain type of soil until we hit 10 feet deep or, mm -hmm. or whatever it is. So that that is probably the largest uh, component that helps aid with my type of design because that soils engineer will very clearly in that report state, hey, we recommend this type of foundation. So you've got a soils report, and then you've got a structure. You've got a plan that says mm -hmm. we're going to do a uh, this type structure, one story, two story, three story, whatever it is. Mm -hmm. And you then have to engineer that foundation to support that structure. But the foundation has to be supported by the ground underneath it. Correct. And that's where you get into different soil treatments you might get into piers you might get into a different type of foundation mm -hmm. so th that's where your real value comes in is putting all that together so that once i've poured that foundation i don't have to worry about what i'm putting on top of it that's the idea is i don't want to hear from you ever again generally <laughs> well you're not the first one to tell me that um <laughs> And that's the collective you. I mean, I don't want to ever hear from anybody. <laughs> At least not for that. Well, uh, thank you. I, I feel better now. Um, how many different kinds of, what, what are different types of engineers people will encounter in residential? Primarily, you're going to just encounter what's known as a civil engineer. And that's what I am by degree, civil engineer. And civil engineers are the types of engineers that design structures and, and things that you see just driving around or looking around in, in, in the city or wherever you are, buildings, roads, bridges, uh, and then things that you don't see like you know, sanitary sewer systems, uh, drainage systems, and um, 
environmental systems that, that help that's with one of like the that. things that, that I've learned uh, as a young contractor that I never knew of course um, one of the things that we deal with around here and in a lot of places is is water flow and it's it, it it's things that affect the foundation it's um, ways of controlling things it's understanding how to maybe slow down how the water's flowing so it gets where you want it to get and doesn't over over tax the drain and the, there's all sorts of things that you look at that are a lot more interesting than well water goes downhill it's how fast does it go downhill and how much of it's going downhill and this mm -hmm. this applies to gutters uh parking lots i've had to do all kinds of things and then yeah. a great engineer would come up with a, a really innovative idea to control these things so you're an idea guy you're a designer as mm -hmm. well as just as the structural um uh, meat and bones kind of person. Yes, yeah. It, water control, water flow is probably the number one um, item uh, of importance for a civil engineer mm -hmm. is, is where is water going to go? Because water affects everything, everything that we do on the site. It affects mm -hmm. the foundation. And like you said, it affects the overall drainage, the erosion of the soils, the uh, retaining walls. It, it, it affects parking lots. It affects how you're um, gutters react around soil the expansion yes sir. All, all these things that we talk about that we have to deal with that that actually cause that callback <laughs> that you don't that want. I don't want yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's true so you have a civil engineer and is that the same as a structural engineer or so yeah. you're you're all it's all kind of one one type of yeah there's there's like your main bullets uh, mm -hmm. like you're you're main bullet would be civil engineering and underneath it is is structural engineering and uh forensic engineering and then you've got soils engineer mm -hmm. which is geotechnical and then you've got environmental engineers and then you know, you'd have another bullet that's like mechanical engineer and they right. deal with the mechanicals of the of the um structure itself man that you know that that's a lot that's a lot to do so you even you've looked at a lot of houses i have and tell us uh some of the things that you or used to seeing like if maybe a homeowner calls you up with a, a crack in the wall or mm -hmm. maybe a, a big sag over the garage door things like that what are some of the things that you typically look for when you walk on their property so when i step foot on your property i am looking at multiple things so i am looking at drainage i'm looking at uh, the locations of existing trees and vegetation i'm looking at how the house sits on the lot so cut and fill lot what, what do we have slopes wise uh, do you have gutters? Do you not have gutters? Do you have uh, a very uh, poor layout of the actual structure itself? Uh, and and then once I walk around the property, I'm looking for cracks and visual things. There are freeze, what are known as freeze board separations. Those are just uh, specific free, uh, separations right up at the top layer of the brick. And uh, then cracks in the, in the slab, of course. But then uh, on the interior, of course, everybody's familiar with drywall cracks. So it's just part so of the you're looking So you're looking for things that that maybe the homeowner doesn't see now th th this is what i do you know yeah. this is my value to my client as I, I go through there and i go uh you may have a problem here you may have a problem there something we need to look at and they're like well i never saw that well one of the reasons you don't always see it is because you're used to seeing it you, it's been there but mm -hmm. you just are used to seeing it yeah. not everything that you point out to somebody is a critical house gonna fall down kind of thing no or no. most of them just manageable or h how do you feel about most that? most items are what we call cosmetic uh just distress items they're not necessarily any anything to worry about uh 90 probably 98 percent of all visual items that i see around a home are, are non-structural related mm -hmm. uh it's it's the smaller two percent that that are are concerned but i've only uh, condemned two houses in my career so far and I've been doing this for the same company for 12 years and looked at probably about 20,000 homes and you know for the most part everything is is either repairable or mm -hmm. we do nothing well I always tell I always tell my clients or potential clients I can fix anything sure it's just how bad do you want to fix it or how bad was it was it messed up because there's a, a lot of structures I look at and I know you look at that were built by people that really just didn't know what they were doing mm. or built during a time when there was literally no regulation on what they were doing and they just didn't know better yeah they weren't trying to do anything bad they just didn't know a two to six 
wasn't big enough <laughs> when you need it where we would now use a tube of 10 or tube of 12 you know we'd now use a larger piece so let's talk a little bit about one of the things that i love that i've seen over my career change so much and that is engineered beams and some of the engineered products that we have available to us that uh, i was telling jason before the show that i i started out uh in in a time when we didn't even have glue lamps we had to take and glue up tube of 12s and nail them and bolt them together to make the beams now that we can buy pre-engineered. Uh, and then we go replace the beams that we put in 20 or 30, not 20, but probably 30, 40 years ago. Yeah, I've got quite a few options as far as being an engineer and, and what I can recommend for uh, to come up with a solution for your issue. And so if you're removing a load bearing wall, let's take a very simple uh -huh. scenario where you want to open up a 20 foot opening in your 1970s house that, you know, now you want it all to be one room. Well, instead of just specking out conventional lumber like you were familiar with doing, I've got glue lambs. Glue lambs are glued, engineered, glued, laminated, engineered beams. So they're pre-manufactured, they're glued. They're basically made of conventional lumber like two by sixes or two by eights. Uh, but those are those are a really easy option. They're easy to install. They're, you can actually sand them up and stain them. They look really cool. And they're rated installed. to carry. They're, so what you're doing when you take out a wall is you're you're making this expansive opening, and so you have to be able to support whatever's on top of it. Sometimes it's a second floor. Sometimes it's a roof. Mm -hmm. And we used to have to find. Well, we used a lot of steel. Sure. When you would get over 18 feet, we used to have to use a lot more steel than we use now. Uh, and that was, uh, we, don't, we still don't have to worry about those. <laughs> that, steel, that, steel never, that steel never quits working. But what Jason's referring to are engineered beams, which I, I love it because it allows me a lot more flexibility in the design mm -hmm. and the alterations that people want me to do, which like you say are, creating one big giant room, you know, removing load bearing walls. Mm -hmm. And we can put these things up in the floors, some, uh, I mean, up in uh, where they're flush with the ceiling, where you can't see the beam sometimes. Flush them out. Yeah. Sometimes you can't. Sometimes you have to put a larger beam in there that's going to show. What are um, some of the ways that you feel you most help builders and homeowners? I think making the process go smoother as far as uh, preventing any kind of uh, like city intervention or, or, you know, shutting the project down, mm -hmm. that kind of thing. But at, at the same time, I mean, keeping the, the public safe uh, from any kind of harm and, and making sure that that structure is never going to have any issues. That's uh -huh. paramount, of course. The, the, the most important part of it is the safety. Absolutely. And when uh, you have uh, building inspectors in your house looking at your project, that's their primary concern as well. That's what they're there for is your safety. I really, really appreciate you coming in and, sure. Thanks for and spending me. time with us today. That really, hopefully this will help people that are uh, thinking, you know, we may need an engineer. Maybe we'll call Jason. Jason <laughs> Jason's easy to work with, but... Um, thank you so much. And, yes, and we look forward to maybe doing this again sometime. I would love it. Thank you so much. Thanks, Alex.